In our streaming obsessed world, do you miss DVD commentary tracks? Well, fear not, because I, the most scorned critic on YouTube, Von Fry, am here to provide you with commentary tracks for the movies we love and sometimes love to hate. Tonight we are watching from 1984, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, starring William Shatner, DeForest Kelly, introducing Robin Curtis, and directed by Leonard Nimoy. But before we get started, I want to give a quick mention to my buddies over at calderalab.com, makers of Earth's finest skincare for men. Their latest, The Body Bar, will have you going boldly to the shower. Use my promo code FRY15 to save 15% at checkout. Okay, well, we've got our popcorn ready. I'm about to pop an IBC root beer. Let's do this. Come on, no mess. All right. Yep, and if you guys would like to follow along while you watch Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, go ahead and queue up to zero, 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 whatever they're calling it over on Paramount Plus and hit play now. All right, we got a black screen. We've got the Paramount logo. This is where this movie should be streaming, right? It just feels weird anywhere else as long as we're going to have a a service actually called Paramount, right? At least that's the way I see it. Oh, it's a tiny picture right there. It almost makes you think that the aspect ratio was off. The we're giving a, a brief recap here of the first film, or actually a Wrath of Khan. Very touching death scene. The, the death of Spock is part of what allows Star Trek to really continue in films. It seems to separate itself. So we're kind of getting everybody up to speed here. Hell, he's got one of the cinema's best funerals, too. Slowly that silver blue begins to get color. Good speech by Kirk, too. I encountered my travels, and actually, Family Guy hits on this too. This was the most human, like fighting back the tears and the crying, right? You know your voice changes as you cry, even if you're a guy. Out the torpedo bay onto the Genesis planet. And so we have what is really the second leg of a little trilogy within the Star Trek films, but I kind of think most people find this one to be behind The Wrath of Khan and The Voyage Home in terms of quality. There are people such as Kramer from Seinfeld and Dave Colon who seem to think this is the best entry in the series. Paramount Pictures presents, now these scenes right here, you saw in Wrath of Khan, they kind of ad hoc appended scenes in after test screenings went negative to try to show that the, maybe there's some possibility of Spock being found, like, hey, his, his coffin's intact perfectly. Um, you never saw it crash land or nothing. course, starring William Shatner. Come on now. DeForest Kelly. What? It didn't say Leonard Nimoy second? What? No, it's just starring two people. This is the most you're going to get out of Bones, out of Dr. McCoy in a Star Trek film. 
And I think DeForest Kelly was one of the stronger actors among the cast. He probably could have done, you know, he could have been better served in some way. I say then it's like co-starring everybody else. Oh yeah, and also here's Mark Leonard. Who I think was the first Romulan they came across. Mary Buttrick returning as um, Jem's son. Introducing Robin Curtis as Lieutenant Savick. Remember, we were introducing the Pride of Wichita, Kirstie Alley. Christopher Lloyd, yes, before he was sending high school boys back in time, he was a villain. James Horner. There's a bit of a tra weird trade-off with these Star Trek films. It's like, sometimes we've got Jerry Goldsmith. Sometimes we've got James Horner. What are we going to do? I mean, you could do worse, right? I'll, of course, for the sake of copyright strike reasons, I'm trying not to have you listen to this. I don't think this is a particularly strong score for the Star Trek films, though. But this one does deliver the first of the cinematic Klingon versus Enterprise battles. I wouldn't say first of the space battles, but because really the Wrath of Khan gives you that space battle stuff. Directed by Leonard Nimoy. This makes sense to me. Um, not often would you... In fact, this could be the first time you had a TV series star direct the movie of which their show was from, but being that Spock has a kind of diminished role throughout most of this film, it, it seems as though he would be available to direct, right? I'm going to try to crank my volume up on my end here. Now, does it mean that Kirk is extra distressed if he has the flap open on his naval-inspired uniform? Now, mind you, he is actually an admiral here. This version of the Enterprise may have not really seen that much action. Scotty's uniform, one of the few holdovers from the motion picture. Of course, everybody is very familiar with the Wrath of Khan through uh, the sixth film, Undiscovered Country uniform here. I want you to ask you guys, does this look like a 1984 movie to you? Obviously, there are some high points for 84 cinema. I'm still upset about Spock. Industrial Light and Magic helping with the visuals in this one, I believe. You always got to enjoy a good miniature in space, right? It would be decades until you could match that look with computer.
Oh, we're still making a thing in Genesis, huh? Come on, Marty. Great, Scott. All right, maybe I got this louder than it needs to be. The very submarine deck of a Klingon bird of prey. It's a bird of prey, right? The Romulans have a bird of prey also, I believe. All right, we're making a trade. Send us something. You weren't supposed to watch this. Female Klingon here. You know what you must do. You weren't supposed to look at the classified documents that I... The classified, I, I could have made them unclassified, but I decided not to. A very green bird of prey, huh? All right, so she knows that they're going to get blown up. Not really letting them know. The Klingons have a weird death wish. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a girl I loved. But you, you're looking at the classified data, so hey, I don't make the rules, right? It's not so simple as to just blow up something, you know, against a blue screen. That you have the debris floating around with the, I think, uh, rotoscope lightning type effects on it. Looking great. Continuing the evolution of the Klingon look that really only settles down for Worf in the next generation. Like We have the crests on the forehead changing. All right, so we have Space Dock, and I'm trying to remember exactly how this was. The Space Dock inverted was something else. I think in Wrath of Khan, they... It, 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 did double duty, like, hey, it's a, it's something else. We'll just fl flip it upside down. But working the scene here for Space Dock is fairly complicated. And you get a sense of wonderment. Just little things like opening the door, taking the ship in. A lot of this works because you have obviously miniatures with a ton of lights and the lights indicate those must be windows it gives a great sense of scale in order to do this you have to make multiple passes and essentially your blue screen box you have to do just like the outline mat of the enterprise and you do the same thing again with computer controlled cameras so you can match this with the lighting on it because the light and the Enterprise itself won't really work in one pass. I, of course, all of this is dinosaur outdated stuff compared to how we... No, okay, we just give this to a programmer in Taiwan. And they'll cook it up. Sulu. Fawning over the Excelsior. Cool looking ship never really see that much action out of it oh hey it's the first they, they mentioned the trans warp but it's not quite worked out the same way as I think trans warp is later explained kind of uh, retcon trans warp to be like it, sometimes it, it depends like it's the be all end all and sometimes it's like warp factor 10 Who's in Mr. Spock's quarters? Remember,
remember, you've probably seen season three of Picard now. We know that Chekhov's going to have a son who becomes president of the Federation. Chekhov, obviously, he's just reassumed his old position because the captain he had in Wrath of Khan kind of died. Was there a real reason to seal his room? I mean, if the guy's dead, you, it's... Um, I don't know if you need to be that concerned about touching his stuff. You know, hey, don't touch my drum kit. Now, I think that there is a possibility that... Spock adding his his Katra to Bones at the end of Wrath of Khan was added also with the test screenings. To I I don't know. It maybe give uh, the audience at the time something to not be so upset about. Okay, you guys are pissed. Whatever. We'll come up with some way to bring Spock back. And it works out fairly well within the science of Star Trek, for better or worse explaining right there. But what I'm saying is it doesn't seem like they just cooked it up in this movie. It seemed like the track was laid. He put the Katra in McCoy, so essentially the spirit, reunite that with the body that gets brought back to life, and though suddenly young and I don't know how it shrank down and regrew but okay we get some explanation for the accelerated growth rate you know the genesis stuff's unstable we're moving you to the excelsior essentially the enterprise crew is being cannibalized here The Enterprise is done. No refit. This guy must be quite the high admiral here, huh? Be bossing around an admiral in front of everybody. Genesis is already a galactic controversy. How long did this take? You could make spacefaring movies in 84. There's another one I need to get to. I haven't seen it in a long time, The Last Starfighter. I remember Joe Bob Briggs was talking about it on Monster Vision, saying that it claimed to have the first computer-generated effects, and he's like, um, have they not seen Tron? Explaining the Genesis Project. For this, I killed my loved one. But I will find another baby mama. Getting a sort of economy special effects here. Let's, let's run the Genesis program again. Get the Klingons up to speed for the audience that maybe didn't watch the second film. It was fairly novel to get a third entry in a movie at this point. Like, occasionally you had a sequel. Occasionally you had a third film that was low budget and didn't have the star in it anymore. Something like that. Aside from maybe James Bond and Rocky... 
braving new territory here, bringing back a big cast. And those are some wild eyebrows on everybody. Christopher Lloyd here, he's got the almost death wish here. Like, he, he wants to bring down Kirk. I never understood Stardates, I'm sorry. Lieutenant Savick. Dr. Marcus, oh, but not the mom. Where could she be? I think Robin Curtis does a pretty good job here as Lieutenant Savick. It didn't occur to me so much that she was the same character as Kirstie Alley. I kind of thought they just had two different Klingon gals. Not really sure what uh, caused Kirstie Alley to not return. She hasn't joined Cheers yet. Ah, oh, there's some tube down there. We should go investigate. It's Captain Spock's tube. Uh, I mean, I guess he's captain of the Enterprise. I guess he had a chair. Kind of seems like whoever was in Because we had another captain. A guy who was going to be the captain of the Enterprise. It's that yanked from him in the motion picture, so that Kirk can be captain. And then, um, you know, kind of a similar situation, a weird... In both of those, it's like a, an odd sacrifice of sorts. All right, I'm going now. Y you take over, Kirk. The effects the Genesis planet had on Spock, you'd think that it would mess these two up also for being down there with them. There's a life form. We gotta go. Ah, yes. The casual wear of Starfleet. Sorry, we don't have uh, wine flutes. We got test tubes. And they say he's just exhausted, that's all. That's the best analysis you can give is McCoy is exhausted and that's why he's wigging out and obsessed with Spock. Sarek, I didn't recognize you until you took off the hood. I think Mark Leonard might have been a 
Klingon in the motion picture also. Could be wrong. Don't you know how these are people, the Vulcans die? It was just his body. Come on. Did he ask to bring, hey, bring me back to the Vulcan? This was not like a huge hit by any means, but Paramount was doing okay in 84. Biggest global hit of the year, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Domestically, Beverly Hills Cop. Which I think was a Paramount film also. I'm going to look that up. So Sarek thinks that the Katro is left with Kirk, but Kirk's not acting weird. So that can't be right. I was right, Paramount Pictures, Beverly Hills Cop. All right, we got it. We we know his final words. We we've heard it. Nope, no Katra. Where could it be? What if one doesn't pass on the Katra? Like you're engaged in a space battle. However, did take off his gloves, go up to McCoy and say, remember, that could be vital. Well, we can't pass on his spirit knowledge. It's a little odd to think that we have various cultures in Star Trek. Um, Klingons, very war-based. Vulcans, science-based, except when it, there seems to be, I don't know, abilities that apply outside of our understanding. Like the Katra, the mind meld. Uh... I would almost consider the nerve pinch an ability. Some people call it the Vulcan neck pinch, but it's actually the nerve pinch. We have... We have Kirk here scrubbing through the Wrath of Khan, looking for... Does they have... They have cameras in great positions aboard the ship, don't they? With perfect audio pickup. Nerve pinch. Oh, we're doing the Katra transfer. And 
that's why he's acting really creepy. Bring in a Mount Celia on Vulcan. Okay, we can do that. We're going to just have to, you know, steal the Enterprise. Sabotage the Excelsior. Yeah, just the usual. Big time dedication here. He's dead already. Like, do we really need to do the ritual stuff? Genesis planet coming along pretty nice. Yeah, I wonder at the rate of the evolution here, you see things like, I think you see like deer. Would you get up to humans? Or maybe something beyond humans quickly. There we go. It's Spock's uh, torpedo coffin. Oh, those are the life forms that almost trilobite. All right, well, I guess that's that. I mean, I guess we could try to open this thing up. Hmm, where's his body? And I suppose if they showed any more Spock's funeral, they'd have to potentially re-edit it to not show Kirstie Alley. Of course, we have to have the super dismissive Federation higher ups here. It's a um, pretty standard procedure in Star Trek to have the distant command people unaware of the circumstance and just say, "No, don't do it. You, you're not. You're not allowed. You do this. It, it's going to be your career. That sort of thing." I am kind of digging Kirk's shirt. I'm willing to risk it all. Like that girl who bites her lip while interviewing the bodybuilder. Gives him the false, well, you talk some sense to me. I guess I won't do it. I'm going to go have a drink. All right. Yeah, I had to try to ask, you know, whatever. The word is no. I am therefore going anyway. <laughs> the party clubbing outfit of McCoy. Oh yeah, super advanced uh, hologram. Yeah, it was obviously done in post. Oh hey, Tribbles. Forgot about that. They're called Tribbles, right? The Trouble of Tribbles?
Why is McCoy talking about logic? It's uh, it's part of that Spock coming through, isn't it? Don't remember this guy who looks like a lionfish. So McCoy is trying to angle himself to get to Vulcan, you know, for this ritual as well. I don't even think we ever see this guy's species again in all of Star Trek. Oh, I'm sorry. He's not going to Vulcan. He's going to Genesis. He wants to reunite. Uh, I, I mean, I guess he could go, just go to Vulcan, really, and then wait for someone else to get Spock on Genesis. Because they... They have to do the ceremony at the mountain on Vulcan, right? So. Security, you're in trouble. You want to go to the Forbidden Planet? You think you're going to nerve pinch me with your old doctor hands? No, you ain't. Because that's how we do. Ah, uh, yes. The I uh, cactus with snow. Not an awful matte painting. Pretty good. Obviously, we're going to be doing a lot of this in, on sets, so. Moving him to the Federation Funny Farm. Wow. You'd have such a thing? Because around here, we just kind of let the uh, crazies roam the streets. Actually, that was funny. How many fingers will hold him? He's doing the Vulcan salute. He's gotten them revenge. The, the, the thing about this is that, and you do get a taste of it in the films, there's a bit of a rivalry thing going between McCoy and Spock. They're friends, but they bicker. Sulu's going to hit on this guy, who looks very familiar. I should look this guy up. How would you like to have to wear that security uniform? Wow. With that goofy hat. Judo flip. And wow, these guys' uniform is no better either. It's like makeshift cosplay Captain America meets Mega Man. There's the Excelsior.
This guy's got like the little whip thing going. Like he's the the sergeant of the police academy or something. Like I don't know what he's got going there. He's got like that little horse whip. Like he has to snap and point to things. Everybody line up, attention, all that stuff. I think I'm patting. Oh, you called me old. It's on, son. Guy looks like James Marsden. That's Admiral Kirk. Whoa. He's a legend. That's kind of the reaction more people should be having across the Federation. You know, we make fun of how people talk in New Trek and... I need to see the second episode of the second season of Strange New Worlds. You have to watch that yet, but as of this recording, watch the first one. You got a little, they were getting back on track with the more formal speech and then derailed it. You're going to say the thing? You got to have a thing to say, you know? Like Pike says, push it. And Spock resorts to, I want this ship to move now or something like that. Uh this guy right here who's kind of mouthing off to Uhura, he was he was giving that, okay, cool, what, you know? Like his speech was grounded in the 80s. We have assembled the club of those who have high collars. Um, gosh, Chekhov looks like a Raggedy Ann and Andy over here. Like, it, something's off with him. Actually, his collar brain gives me Wednesday Adams vibes. While Kirk here looks like Dracula. And Bones is Leisure Suit Larry in the future. Sulu could be wearing pajamas, I guess. Only Uhura and Scotty seem to actually have uniforms. All right, I think we're going to get a brief appearance of Miguel Ferrer here. Hmm, I'm the snooty captain, and I shall bring my little whip. Oh no, it's a yellow alert. What are we going to do? You guys better open that door. We are reversing our way through the door, right? Well, he's got the little whip. And... There's Ferrer. Just a few years from now, you will be essentially Robocop's dad. All right. We're going to give chase. Let's see what this bad boy can really do. Hey, I had to reverse a, a Jeep Grand Cherokee with a 
travel trailer will help guide it. And this is kind of giving me flashbacks to what I was doing a few hours ago. Like they're trying to back their way through the space doors. Space doors, one word right there. Was the assumption that they'll open the doors to avoid a cataclysmic accident? All this stuff looks pretty good to me. I mean, you can see the matte outline, sure. I think a more modern approach to this, we'd have a lot more spaceships flying in and around. All right, once we get to warp there, we're going to be catching them, no problem. Sure you are. You don't think the crew of the Enterprise wouldn't be one step ahead? Oh, yes, he will. He will sit in that captain's chair and like it. Cool warp effect. Oh, we actually buckle in like it's a roller coaster over here. Trans warp, we have to hit, hit this like it's a roller coaster, do we? We don't just get to walk around like... Typical warp. Nope, Excelsior dead in the water. And of course, it will give the sinking ship thing, of which I think we kind of started in some of the Star Wars, particularly Return of the Jedi, when a ship, ship loses power. Okay, well, actually, Ion Cannon fires, knocks a Star Destroyer, and it kind of sinks a little. Now, I guess maybe it didn't dip down and sink, but it, it's a thing that does happen in Star Wars that isn't accurate to how... I mean, you don't really sink in space, really. You kind of just would continue floating, I would assume. I'd like to see the Enterprise take on a... A Star Destroyer. See what that matchup would look like. I think the Enterprise D might be the largest of the Enterprises. And it could maybe be comparable to a Star Destroyer in size. Alright, we're wandering around the snowy cacti. Searching for the uh, moan that we heard earlier. That must be it. We're going to have various states of boy playing a young Spock. Did I look up these actors, see what they've been doing since then? No, I did not. Now, I think it's beneficial that Savick is here. Because she, being a Vulcan, she can understand possibly what's going on here. A Vulcan child on the planet, what happened? I 
Okay, it regenerated him, but wh what's he doing over here? So far away from his craft. A.K.A. Coffin Torpedo. Oh, yeah, he's not contaminated. He just has uh, weird regenerative properties, you know, highly fluctuating development. Not radioactive. Bring him aboard. Uh oh. Jamming our transmission. Ah, uh, the sneaky Klingons coming out of cloak. And you can tell that this ship is not ready for combat. This Federation ship is dinky. Stand by. All right, you, you stood by for evasive instead of taking evasive action. You weren't supposed to kill him right away. Sometimes Star Trek doesn't know what it wants to do with phasers. It's like it can be set on stun, sure. The lethal, either it's an incinerator um, or possibly the same as stun, but you say they're dead. Nobody here seems to be particularly cold, do they? Not seeing, you know, the chills, the ice breath. Mm, we'll be there in under three hours. Nice. Oh, he's he's acting very Vulcan over here, McCoy is. I think still the same boy actor. He will, he will become a teenager soon enough. Actually, you know, I mentioned here that Christopher Lloyd, I don't think that he want, he has a vendetta against Kirk, but he wants the Genesis stuff, weapon against the Federation, that sort of thing. In the, the act of war of taking out the Klingon here, as the Klingons see it, Kirk becomes like Klingon enemy number one, essentially arrested for it as such in... Star Trek VI for the events of this movie. Reprimanded at the start of Star Trek IV for the events of this movie. Although the hearing really kind of gets interrupted and then essentially carried out by, by the end of it. Those trilobites have grown and... Uh, Goofy worms. Klingon language 
really getting expanded well in this film. And I think that, you know, they try to make an actual language out of this and it carries over to the Next Generation series. You know, I gotta wonder, would it be beneficial for a planet to never have nighttime? Like, for the plants to always be growing, or would they get tired out quicker? Would they get tired out, burned out, or, I mean, more fires, or would, would crops grow bigger, more efficiently? The planet and the child are aging in surges. Um, this guy, I, he would succumb to AIDS, I think, shortly thereafter this film. I shall look it up. Like Merritt Buttrick, I think he passes away shortly after this. Eighty nine. Okay, so yeah, shortly thereafter anyway. Man, weird to think he's like twenty six here. Looks mature. Good job dropping that collar check off. Sometimes it's bones, sometimes it's Spock you're, you're kind of getting here when you when you say hello to to McCoy. The planet in turmoil. Similar sort of experience in another 84 film, The Neverending Story. All right, now this gets a little creepy. There may be things that happened here off camera. It's part of your head cannon. We're, we're, yeah, Spock's going through Pon Far. Did did Spock and Savick hook up? That's what we must we must try to get through here, guys. And is it is it a true hooking up or is it a hook up in the in a Vulcan mental capacity? Seems like we're doing some romancing to me. I can't think of much else Robin Curtis has done um, outside of this and just, you know, a brief bit in The Voyage Home. Excellent. You know, if you think about it, the Vulcans typically a nice race. 
not a whole lot of lying. They have to get around some th- some way to do lying, whatever logical. But kind of sinister eyebrows, the eyebrows that would be on a villain, right? Remember, they're not on a mission to attack the Federation. They're on a mission to preserve the Klingon. Um, Is it Klingon dynasty? I'm trying to remember the term there. A scout vessel was there. I think the Grisham isn't going to be contacting you back, Kirk. All right, now Savick is fully dressed here. She's not doing the, you know, blanket over the chest, smoking a cigarette thing. But what happened? What do you think transpired? Doesn't this kind of look familiar, uh, like like the set of the Neverending Story as well? And a woman. I like her very matter-of-fact tone-deaf delivery. I think she makes for a very good Vulcan here. Possibly, in a way, better than Kirstie Alley, who was, is not... She has an inert sass that needed to shine through. You know, it's not the best role for Kirstie. All right, battle stations. All right, we're just scanning. We're looking for something. Hmm. Federation really had a tough time ever figuring out how to detect the cloaked vessels, you know? We don't have something we can disperse in space, make like a fog of sorts or a paint. AI doesn't detect the distortions, right? A, uh, realistically, AI would play a much bigger part in the space exploration as, uh, as we're seeing AI evolve before our eyes. In fact, you could probably get AI now to provide a commentary track for a movie. And it would just, you know, gleam IMDb trivia and say it while the scene is happening in the voice of the actors.
I do appreciate how these space battles in these early Star Treks feel like a submarine, na a submarine movie, a naval combat uh, type film. Call their bluff. We outmaneuver. Fire, you know, fire cannons, fire torpedoes, phasers. Essentially, oh, the dog died. If you want to call that a dog. And look, it kind of sinks. All right, so there was some sinking in this. Well, the ship really wasn't ready for combat, sir. Oh, geez. It's amazing how frequently they can do stuff with the Enterprise and a skeleton crew. Because they had the skeleton crew motif in Season 3 of Picard. That's a bigger Enterprise. This Enterprise is, it may or may not be the model from the motion picture, but it was painted different. The motion picture had a pearlescent paint about it. And that, I think, was ditched for the Wrath of Khan. It's a, overall still a pretty good looking quality model. You expect the Klingon to surrender? It's not really their way. I don't fully understand why the Klingons didn't bring the three hostages aboard their ship. All right, you have the, we have to take your word here. You got three prisoners. You couldn't have brought them aboard. And there really isn't anything they can do with the Genesis device here. Like, we kind of used it. And the Genesis stuff is the planet at this point. Spock? Alive? Oh, we got the dramatic lighting going there. High contrast. I really dig the smoke in the scenes. Yeah, you guys want Genesis, but you're going to really kill the guy who created it. So, I mean, this isn't really the way to go about th you know business here, Klingons. No, this guy means business. He's like, kill one of them right now. Then we'll negotiate. Only the human really acts like he knows what's at stake here. Time for any mini miny mo. The Klingon knife, pretty cool. You see those around? I remember... 
I was at a daycare center and the father of one of the kids brought his Klingon knife. I, it was the nineties. You could do this. I, and I know now it sounds sinister, but what's going on? Savick, what's happening? Oh no, David here. Good line delivery here. David is dead. How would you like to have to get the news in that fashion? The zero bedside manner. Um, yeah, um, Kirk is now, uh, just destroyed with pain and grief, right? Can't even sit in his chair. Hey, still two prisoners for you to save. All right, so he wants the Enterprise. They're going to give it up, but there's going to be some trickery. Hey, it was just supposed to be a fun little jaunt. We sabotage the Excelsior. We try to reunite the Katra and the body. We find out the body's still alive. And then we had to go and get my son killed, right? The rest of you, we have a job to do. And when that job is, I mean, we got to get get moving here. He said he'd give you two minutes. This dude's a pretty cold villain. He made it pretty clear up front when he just, you know, blasted to pieces his uh, lover. I guess. Um, yeah, here I am the whole time not remembering his name. Because when it comes to Star Trek villains, the gold standard is Khan. Noonien Singh. All right, we got the self-destruct code. So many um, promotions, right? We got Admiral, here's Commander. Let's check off. Also a Commander. Uhura is a Commander. Spock is a Captain. Sulu will be a Captain of the Excelsior. Zero, zero, zero. Did you say destruct zero? Like, there's a ton of zeros. And what wouldn't I expect to be walking into a, a booby trap of this sort, right? They're really going to blow up their ship just to take out some of my crew? What does that leave them, right? Of course, as you think about it, this bird of prey actually somewhat beloved in the franchise as it gets to be known as the bounty, saves 
the Federation, Earth, all that, when it rescues the the whales in the next film. But what kind of dastardly stuff did it do under Klingon stewardship? We know it took out a scout ship, right? Took out those those guys with the information at the beginning of this film. What else has it done? I think this moment here is played up for laughs in a in a ride of the line way. Hmm, the computer's speaking. What's it saying? And he realizes it's a self-destruct. They're just kind of like, huh? But I think that is Majel Barrett talking as the ship's computer, I think. Because she is, like, always the ship's computer, essentially. And, yeah, you can you can see some matte lines here around. See where it's a little faded red out in space. But otherwise, a lot of this looks really damn good. That's a quality explosion. The chunk blowing away. Saucer section goes up. And this, I think, is going to tear up on re-entry. Mind you, we have not seen Leonard Nimoy yet. Damn, that's a good-looking fireball over the over the atmosphere. Good line there. I just kind of interrupted. You know, what have I done? What you what you had to do? So on. The planet's breaking up as though the nothing is eating it. We get a little bit of a American werewolf in London type vibe out of this Growing Pains transformation here. Super Vulcan rage uh, hormone strength right there, I guess, right? Here we go, a little bit of face transformation stuff. Of course, we're focusing more on the reaction shot than... The transformation itself with the uh, limitations of the day. Was that a kill shot? I don't know. It blasts him back a ways. Uh, my son, David. Can the planet bring him back to life? We're going to assume no for some reason. And he knows she's not lying. He must have fought them off for the, as best he could. All is marvels, you say. A 
It's the nothing, I tell you. In fact, did, I, I don't even think Kirk knows this guy's name, he, too. Just Klingon Commander. There we go. That's what you see on Earth. That's life, essentially. How many guys does uh, Klingon Commander have left? Kind of hard to get the drop on somebody, even uh, beaming in, because you could, everybody can see it happening, right? All right, so there's a guy named Maltz. Is that what, what we're getting there? There's a fair bit of bluffing on the part of Kirk in these films. Hey, I have the Genesis secret. No, not really, but I'll say I do. Trying to argue if a Klingon about dying in battle of sorts. Not really the best way to do this. If you're seeking to preserve your own life. Klingons typically shown to be far uh, more resilient, durable, stronger than humans. I'm just seeing here how the back of his tunic of sorts, it looks like a spinal cord. Yeah, we're going to let Shatner have like a macho have it out moment here. How do we say that the planet's looking unstable? I know, volcano. All right, now. Give me your hand. Why is he trying to help him? Like, and then he's like, okay, now, now it's over. But this is funny. I have had enough of you. You see... How does he know that the third strike with his foot, with his boot, is going to knock him off the ledge? I've had enough of you. Like, uh, I mean, what if it took more? I've had enough of you. I've, I have had enough of you. Now. Fall. I'm going to keep hitting you till you fall. Like, how would that have gone down? Um, I, I don't think it's the most realistic way for him to have, have known for sure how many strikes it's going to take to knock this guy over, right? I don't know if you could call that an error. It's not a plot hole. 
it is certainly a plot convenience that he conveniently fell at the end of the line. All right, I think we finally are going to have Leonard Nimoy in our movie. If not right now, in a, in a short while. Speaking Klingon to beam up, hoping that they, the Klingon crew beams him up, I guess. Okay, I am curious how uh, how did the crew of the Enterprise being beamed aboard how did they take over the ship? Maybe we should have saw that, but they wanted to preserve a sort of reveal so that the audience is in the discovering at the same time as Kirk that it's their bird of prey now. I mean, they were beamed aboard with, what, no phasers pointed on them? Is it the case that there's only one guy aboard the Bird of Prey? The Genesis planet is no more. What? You're not going to kill me? I wanted to get killed. Klingons like to get killed. Come on. Leonard Nimoy, finally. <laughs> you know, almost an hour and a half into the movie. Got to get this thing stuck, stuck in my head back into your head. Fortunately, the Spock body is very much a body at this point. We're actually getting a McCoy monologue in a Star Trek movie. Could be wrong, but I think DeForest Kelly would have turned a hundred this year. Gonna look that up. Oh no, he would have turned a hundred in twenty twenty. Hundred and three if still alive. Okay, so when did Uhuru get to Vulcan ahead of everybody else? Not that we ever saw her aboard the Enterprise being stolen. Maybe she was behind opening the doors for Space Dock, and I wasn't paying that much attention. But I would think that you don't actually need one of Kirk's people to be behind that. It could have been done... Out of, we don't need a crash in the interior of Space Dock. Vulcan, not exactly a um, harmonious 
planet beaming with life, right? I mean, it's big statues, cliffs, volcanoes. I kind of wonder how anybody made this a home, right? I mean, for a civilization to spring out of it. You can see those guys have the robes with the immense uh, uh, arm, uh, wrist areas. What? Why might not remember what that is? And we'll see that Spock essentially gets put in one of those. And that becomes uh, essentially his costume for the next film. All right, we're not wearing bras underneath. In fact, the one on the far left, it kind of looks like we can see a lot more through her costume than we're supposed to. And this movie is rated PG for... I don't know, we're going to have to zoom in and see what, what we're... Goodness sake. These guys, they're like, look, we don't have badges, but we have these gemstones we adorn to our, oh, I don't know, plates of armor here. Look, I just need this Katra out of me, okay, lady? I'll do whatever it takes. Grave danger, okay, whatever. Yeah, you're in danger. Operation goes smoothly. No lasting side effect. Choose the danger. I like the way he elected to say that. I choose the danger, and then girls wearing very thin gowns will approach you. And that is the danger. All right, let's get the ceremony on the way. I mean, we arranged for all of these people, all these resources to be present for the ceremony. We got the guy working the gong. You know, you called ahead, you, you made plans. Making a big spectacle out of it. And then you want to tell the guy there's danger and... Give him a chance to chicken out. I like the fact that there isn't a weird, possibly would be laughed at dated effect to accompany this. Like there's no lightning bolt spirit leaving one's head and floating into the next guy. says really just reaction shots of people waiting which might be the the better taste way to go about this growing impatient
Yeah, all I've ever seen of Vulcan is, uh, you know, it's not really a destination to go to. It's, like, pretty inhabitable. I don't know, did they ever show Vulcan in the original series? And if so, maybe I'll get to those episodes on Paramount+. Plus. Wow, the maidens with the thin shirts. We weren't asking about you. I want to know if Spock was okay. See, they gave him one of those robes. Took a line from Bones there. You did what you had to do. What I've done is what I had to do. The strongest bromance in the galaxy. I suppose the next film I'll be doing a commentary on will be The Voyage Home. I'll have to look and see if this uh, pattern with the triangles remains on Spock in that film. He obviously had time to swap out and wear a different robe, but he does wear a white robe. And we're actually going to get a line from Spock here late in the movie. Come on, you got something to say, don't you? Uh, we had an awkward moment. Someone <laughs> looked look down in shame. Everybody else seeing if he recognizes them. Hopeful. But you in particular, Captain Admiral. Oh, he doesn't remember, but he's saying he they say you're my friend. We came back for you because the needs of the one outweigh the means of the many. The needs of the many. Uh inverse of what Spock would say. See if this kind of jives with him. Vaguely remembering his final words. Oh, he remembers the situation. Of course, by um, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, he will essentially be old Spock, and this will be all but forgotten, really. And the next one, they'll be like, come on, it's Jim. Don't call me Captain. Don't call me Admiral. But just call me Jim. Don't you remember? I don't think in the original series he called him 
Jim so much. I'm going to try to listen for it, but I think he called him Captain. Maybe as I get through the seasons, because I mean, I'm sure I've seen it all before, but years back and can't recall, but... And the adventure continues. The only one that kind of ends with uh, titles like that, right? All right, so if they have The Voyage Home, I'll be doing that next. So they have that on Paramount+, Plus, which I'm hoping they do. I'm assuming they do. I think they've it's now the home to all these Star Treks. What do you think of this one? Do you agree with Kramer and Dave? Is it your favorite? Let me know in the comments below. Until next time, adios.